Yeah, John Dan Lear. I'm a physical oceanographer, which means study the physics of the ocean. Trained at Woods Hole and MIT. Um, I worked as a uh, rocket scientist before that. I'm a Where? mechanical uh, MIT. Oh, you worked at MIT? Yeah. Okay. So I've been at, at the University of Miami since 71. I teach oceanography undergraduate and graduate level. I also teach sustainable living, how to live on the earth as though you'd like it to last. And I'm um, very passionate about this stuff. So I'm delighted you've given us the opportunity to actually talk about uh, what I think is the most important issue for Florida and the, and the world. Uh, okay. So, so what do you teach? Uh, I teach uh, climate. I okay. teach uh, uh, the physical climate system. I teach classes on El Nino, which I'm sure you've heard about. Yeah. One of my favorites. Are you uh, having hurricanes this year? Uh, it certainly doesn't uh, look promising at the moment for hurricanes. We've got a nice dust layer coming in, and El Nino kind of suppresses those things. So that's all kind of happening. Uh, and I teach uh, uh, weather and so, uh, dynamics. So on that, on, as, as every day goes by, the probabil probability just continues to drop. The probability continues to drop. Now we haven't. The peak day is, of course, September 9th. So we haven't we haven't hit the peak day, you know, where there's maximum potential for hurricanes. So, but but definitely the uh, when you look at the environmental conditions today, and they tend to persist for the next 10 or 15 days, it looks unlikely that uh, at the moment we're doing pretty well. That's good. Not so, not so good in the Pacific. All the, uh, all the insurance companies will be happy. Sure, sure. Yeah, I'm Hal Wanless. I'm chairman of geology at the University of Miami. Like John, I've been there since 1971. My students and I, most of our research has been in looking at the evolution of our coastal and shallow marine environments over the last five to 7,000 years as sea level rose to its present position. So we've done a lot of work on trying to define the sea level dynamics and hurricane effects and so on, the bigger picture things that are in the landscape and coastal. And I teach sedimentology, mineralogy. I just had our students up in Newfoundland Labrador for a month this summer. students are finishing, where are they going to work? Most of them go on to, to the undergraduates, most of them go on to graduate school. A lot of them still go with petroleum and gas companies because the, the, the money is quite nice. Um, but many of them are going in to, to work with natural hazards, everything from, um, from nuclear waste disposal to groundwater um, pollution and, and just groundwater. And are most of them staying, and so most of them are not staying in Florida then? A lot of them do. Yeah. Uh, uh, right now I'm focused for the undergraduates. I used to have some in school folks in the undergraduate students. Um, the undergraduates, of course, go on to grad school. Many of them come a lot, but many of them have to go to school too. So did you, did, did you guys go there in 71 just because they were starting a program? Is that why? Yeah, no, I was in there. It was there long before us. Okay. Yeah. You know, I was finished and leaving for a job. Yeah, it's, a nice place to it it's been a good place to study tropical marine environment. David Hastings, I uh, work at Edward College. I'm a marine geochemist and a paleoclimatologist. So I, oh, what's that mean? Uh, I study the history of climate change. So I look at uh, what happened 10 and 20,000 years ago and 500,000 years ago. Particularly interested in the climate of Florida and how the climate of Florida has changed, especially rapid climate change about 20,000 years ago. And uh, looking at cores in Florida, sediment cores. Mm -hmm. uh, I teach a class in chemistry. I teach general chemistry. Teach uh, advanced classes in marine geochemistry and chemical oceanography. So uh, I also teach a class in climate change science. So what type of degrees do you have? I've got a, a, a degree from Princeton. No, no, the ones, no, the ones your students. Oh, yeah, we have a very strong uh, program in marine science. A good program in uh, chemistry and biology. A pretty strong environmental science program. But it's marine science uh, really that students come to Eckerd College for. So. And where are they going to work? Gosh, they, a lot of them stay in Florida. So they come from around the country, mm -hmm. most every state. And uh, once they come here, they want to stay. So what type of companies are hiring them? You know, uh, a lot of state agencies, uh, even around St. Pete in the Tampa Bay area, some of them come up to Tallahassee. So uh, Jeff's wife uh, went to Eckerd College a long time ago. And, uh, but a lot of them stay here. And they're working in coastal and agencies, departments, um, so DP, uh, Florida Fish and Wildlife, that sort of thing. Okay. Yeah, so good job. Good job. Yeah. All right. Great. 
Governor, we uh, we have a short presentation if that would be appropriate. That's great. And uh, we appreciate the opportunity. And everybody's met Noah, right? I've had the pleasure of meeting some of you in, in person and not like any of that. No, I talked to you uh, okay. at lunch. And yeah, why don't you go ahead and get into that then? Sure. Um, graduate from University of Florida from have a great environmental policy program mm -hmm. down there. It's an interdisciplinary program and then have been involved in environmental policy ever since. So they're working in a state agency like UCF, all of the students right. Right. like yours that went to a state agency right. afterwards. And then I work with most of the environmental nonprofits in Florida, whether it's um, Florida Audubon Society, Everglades Foundation, um, Save the Manatee Club, and others. And it's a passion I have and a privilege to work with the governor on these issues. Thank you for having us. Um, we appreciate the opportunity to provide you with a better understanding of the reality of human induced, human induced global warming changes that are occurring and are projected to occur throughout this century. We're here because major climate change is already happening. Further warming of our atmosphere and oceans will occur through this century and pretty certainly beyond. This will result in accelerating ice melt, which is already happening, and accelerating sea level. Florida will be seriously and catastrophically affected. Florida is among the most vulnerable places in the world for the impacts of sea level rise, and Miami tops the list. In Figure 2, the one you have before you, elevation maps of Miami, Dade, and Broward County illustrate their extreme vulnerability to the global sea level rise that is projected through the next hundred years. Most low coastal counties will become challenging places to live for the end. And it's very possible that our coastal barrier islands will be seriously diminished in the next four to sixty years. It's not far away. We're pleased with this opportunity to share with you the reality and the rates of human induced climate change. The best available science must be available to and used by you and other state leaders so as to make the best policy decisions. The people of Florida simply have too much to lose with climate from climate change if government at all levels is not fully engaged in planning and preparation. People's businesses and communities of Florida need meaningful state leadership for planning and for action. They need leadership to curtail global warming in promoting implementation of all non-fossil fuel energy sources and in preparing people, businesses, and communities for those changes that are inevitable. Vulnerability of Florida also provides a unique opportunity for Florida become a leader in climate change policy, business initiatives, greenhouse gas reduction protocols, and so on, on the nation, national and international scale, and we should be doing that. And the really good news is there are very major employment and business opportunities associated with states that choose to take this lead. We're here today, Dr. Jeffrey Santon, Professor of Ocean Arts at Florida State will begin by looking at the natural dynamics of uh, climate through time. That's sort of the baseline. Then Dr. Ben Kirkman, well, Professor of Atmospheric Science and Ocean Science, will document how the human component has significantly added to and now overwhelms the natural climate change. Dr. David Hastings uh, at Ecker College will focus on what we see as needed at the state level. And finally, Dr. John Van Leer uh, at the University of Miami will provide critical closing comments. We should have time for questions and discussion at the end, and I thank you for giving us this opportunity. Thanks, Jim. Thanks for having us. Uh, I'll just show you this here. Please get it. So, this is what got me so worried about this. Was, where are you? I'm on this one here. Yeah, where, where is it? Oh, this is uh, just a picture of guys taking ice cream. And this is the kind of data I'm going to show you. But the ice core, if you go down, this ice is accumulating vertically. And so you get this time sequence. So time is death, okay? And these cores and it, are It's in Greenland and or yeah. Antarctica. Greenland and Antarctica. Yeah, I've been to Antarctica. So this is really nice one. This is uh, in Greenland where we have more rapid accumulation. And what this shows you here, sir, is you have a time scale of 1,000 years. Here we are now. It goes back to 1,000 years. Pre-industrial time. CO2 is going along with two years. I mean, you can see this rise right here in the Industrial Revolution. It went up, and now it's 400. Okay, so let's go to the next one, because I don't have that much time. Which one, next slide? Next, yes, yeah, turn it over. <laughs> so, 
So we have longer records now that we get from Antarctica where the ice accumulates more slowly. And so it turns out that the Earth has kind of got two channels for climate, channel A and channel B. Channel A is this glacial climate when it's cold, and right now we're in the interglacial channel B when it's warmer, so cold and warm. Okay, and it flips back and forth. And now, what's the what's the typical? Hundred thousand years. Hundred thousand years instead of clock five. Okay, we have about eighty thousand years of glacial and ten to twenty thousand years of warm period. Can you go through um, how do you how do you know the cycle? What do you tell? You test it like in Greenland. This is from Antarctica. This is the record. See, and and we get these. These are paleo temperatures. That's what David does. And so you can see these warm periods and it's warm, warm, warm every hundred thousand years. It's just amazing. Going back 400,000 years. So here's warm, and you can see it varies by about eight degrees. Warm, cold, warm, cold, warm, cold. And the CO2, this is what got me worried about this. The CO2 is correlated with that exactly. So when it's warm, you have CO2 of 280 in the, in the, uh, in the, the ice cores. Which is which on this, which, what's the CO2? The green? The red. Oh, the, red. The, red the green is methane, which is another greenhouse gas, mm -hmm. okay, like natural gas. Mm -hmm. So the red is CO2, 280, 180, 280, 180. Warm, cold, warm, cold. They're correlated exactly. They run together. And now we've jacked up the CO2 to over 400. Okay? And, so, and as this is going on, the sea level is going up and down 300 feet. Because when you warm the ocean, it expands and it takes up more space. And when you melt the ice, it runs into the sea. So sea level, CO2, and temperature are all running together. They're correlated. This is, it's so magnificent. how much worldwide land mass is lost when the sea level is at its highest? Well, it's somewhere like Florida, the lowest it's significant. The, you know, the lowest or the highest. In Florida, it can vary by 50 percent. You know, like it, when it tries to see the, the the West Florida, you know, like the the West Florida shelf is very shallow and it goes way out, but the tide goes way down. So this is just showing you the CO2, right? And it stays between 180 and 200, 280 for 400,000 years. Here we are now. While this is doing this, sea level is going up and down 300 feet, okay? And so, and that's with a 100 parts per million CO2 variation, 300 feet. Now, if you add another 100 parts per million CO2, you might expect sea level to rise. That's what worries me. And by the year 2100, if we just keep doing what we're doing, the, sea level, the CO2 is going to be 700 parts. And that's seriously a different world. It hasn't been like this for 800,000 years. You get up here, and you're going back millions and millions of years. And it's going to be a different planet for our children. And that's, that's really what concerns me. When I first saw this, this is when I got on board with this whole thing and started trying to make people know about it. And, and I'm very concerned. That's my concern. Thanks. So, uh, again, I also just want to echo everyone's kind of really appreciate your time today. Thank you very much. So, I'm on uh, the slide that says multiple lines of evidence. And so, uh, what I've been charged with is to talk about uh, what we call the modern instrument record. So what's been happening over the last hundred years and uh, how we know that there, we see human-induced climate change. And so there's a lot of pictures there and I expect you to study up and take the quiz at the end of this and pass it fully. But really the key point here is that since the 1950s, the climate system has warmed. And that's unequivocal. The science on that is just 100% solid. There's no debate about that whatsoever. And you can see this, the big picture on the, on the right-hand side there. That's the, that's the uh, heat uptake in the climate system. And you can see this huge signal in the ocean. The ocean is sucking up tremendous amounts of heat. Okay? And this is, this is all consistent with the climate system that is continuing to warm and will continue to warm. There's no indication here whatsoever that this will stop. And then uh, the next slide, and this is where, this is where oh, these are just different. These are different. This, this, mul this mul exactly these multiple lines of evidence. One of the th one of the reasons we're s we feel so strongly that this is unequivocal is there's multiple lines of evidence, multiple data sets, um, uh, four different data sets for sea surface temperature, four different data sets for land temperature, six different data sets for sea level, three different data sets for sea ice. It's just so much wealth of evidence that support this notion that the climate system is warm since the night. Governor, when he said we, he meant the IPCC. Yeah, 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 thank you. Which is not us five folks here. Yeah, yeah. This is a huge body of people. That, that's an, Im that, an important that point. Yeah, that's an important point. And the, these quotes at the top, these are those IPCC statements. I mean, this is, this is really the AMA, if you will, of climate science. Uh, and so the next panel, if you turn your page, 
This is the controversial one. This is the one where all the fighting is all about, and that is how do we know humans are involved, right? And again, I emphasize this IPCC approach and actually the National Climate Assess Assessment approach that it's, it's uh, multiple lines of evidence. It's not one study, it's multiple papers, multiple modeling studies, multiple data analysis. It's really this multiple lines of evidence. And the particular, the two I'm showing you is just an analysis of the temperature record, and it breaks that, that modern instrument record down into the part that's due to the sun, changes in the temperature that's due to the sun, the part that's due to volcanoes, the part that's due to El Nino, one of my personal favorites, the part that's due to other natural modes of variability, and then ultimately, the one with the big oval, black oval on it, the part that's due to uh, greenhouse gases. And you can see just from this analysis, and this is not the only one, there's many, many of these, that it's really the greenhouse gases. And these are greenhouse gases that come from human activities that are leading to the warming since the middle of the last century. The second panel is showing that we did exactly the same thing. We can do that with our best climate model. And this is, this is climate models all over the world. These are the best scientists in the world analyzing the, the best climate models in the world doing it very sophisticated experiments. This is really robust stuff. These are, you know, physicists and mathematicians and, and chemists really taking this seriously. And we can, we can determine how much of that signal is coming from greenhouse gases, how much is coming from solar volcanoes and things like that. Notice the sulfate curve there. That's a cooling effect. We understand that. That sulfate aerosols can actually cool part of the atmosphere. Mount Tennessee. Mount Tennessee. Now the last panel that I want to show. This is uh, uh, this comes from the 2012 National Climate Assessment, and uh, this is a Florida-centric plot. This is sea level rise. This is uh, really where the rubber hits the road, and um, I'm showing you here projections that go uh, that current that include the current, the black curve, but also projections into the future, and um, with four different scenarios. So the first scenario is basically a consistent, just pushing the trend out into the future. The second one is this low, intermediate, low, third, intermediate, high, and then the highest. And I want to emphasize that those two intermediate, low, and intermediate, high, they don't include the ice melt that Hal and John are so worried about, and probably say a couple more words about. So they don't include that ice melt. And then that inset, that nice little inset, that's showing you the IPCC projection that was made in 2005. That's what that gray is, the projection. And then the blue curve is, is what actually happened from satellite data. So it's really the, actually what's actually been happening is on the very highest end of the IPCC projection. And that's because we're not doing a, a good enough job of including that fresh water that comes from those ice sheets. So just to sum up, Warming since the 1950s is unequivocal. Our confidence is at 95% to 100% that since the 1950s, the bulk of the warming is due to human activity. And sea level is rising and continues, will continue to rise. And ice sheets will con uh, continue to contribute to that. When the water gets warmer, it expands you know, it becomes less dense, and so it takes on more energy. And I want to, the last point I want to make before David has his, uh, his five minutes is the, there's two, important problems here, that, and we need to attack both. One is the adaptation problem. The climate is changing, and we're, we're, we look at, we're, we're guaranteed to a certain amount of that. The ocean is warm, I showed you that picture. So we need to make sure Floridians are well positioned to adapt to those climate changes, that we can, that we can maintain this wonderful state. And the second problem we have to do is the mitigation problem. We have to, we have to see what we can do to prevent those highest, highest sea level rises. So there's two problems. And I think, I think Hal really nailed it. Florida is uniquely positioned to be a, a leader, in the, not only a leader in the US, but a leader in the world in how to adapt and how to mitigate the effects of climate change. Great. So I'd like to reiterate just how appreciative I am, and I think collectively we are, of your, of your interest here. Um, we're all, we've all been studying this for a long time, and collectively we're, we're interested and, and we're concerned, as are many of our colleagues. So, um, we know that it's happening now. Global temperatures are rising. We know that humans are causing it. There's really no, uh, very, very little doubt about that. And the remarkable thing is that the scientists all agree on this. There's a remarkable consensus that's rarely 
achieved in the scientific community. We all agree that the temperatures are rising and that it's attributable to us, to humans. Um, the fourth important point is we can't wait. We've waited a little while, but we need action now. And the wonderful thing is solutions are available. We can fix it. Uh, uh, there are viable solutions, and uh, we will see some impacts from climate change, but the degree to which we do something will determine what, what the impacts are. So what we as a community are, are interested in is, is how the state of Florida is going to respond to the science that we presented. We need strong leadership from your office and from you, you in particular, to take action to minimize the losses that we're, we're so concerned about. So we know that the costs for not taking action are quite large. We're seeing them now. We're seeing a sea level in, in Miami. Excuse me. Sea, the seas are rising in Miami. Um, we're seeing fresh drinking water contaminated. We're seeing coral reefs die off. We're seeing these losses, and we're hoping that uh, we can now move forward to looking at solutions, because they're close at hand, and these losses can be reduced substantially by using mitigation strategies that are available using the best available science. So in particular, we're looking at this EPA Clean Power Plan. It calls for a reduction of carbon emissions by 38%, which is a lot in the next 15 years, which is a relatively short period of time. Um, and so we're wondering how the state of Florida, and how your office in particular, how the various state agencies are going to respond to this requirement. The governor's office, we hope, will develop a transparent process to develop and then implement the plan to reduce these carbon emissions. And we're hoping that, you, that your office is a, are able to bring all the stakeholders together to the table and, and uh, integrate all the stakeholders into the process. So in terms of solutions, a lot of people have seen the problem. Uh, I'd like to just demonstrate that there are easy solutions. One of them is to reduce or eliminate coal burning power plants. We know that these are dirty. They emit tremendous amount of carbon dioxide. So that's, that's one of the low hanging fruit. Another is to increase efficiency. Uh, these buildings that we air condition and heat are, are really quite inefficient. And across the board, our energy uh, infrastructure is, is pretty inefficient. So if we increase efficiency, that's another very easy low-hanging fruit. And finally, we're in the Sunshine State. We can develop and implement um, better renewable power, primarily solar. So we can heat hot water and uh, generate electricity using solar power. So. Um, as scientists, we're the, we're the map makers. We're the people that uh, demonstrate these figures. We look at the islands and the roads and the forests. We're, we develop a map. And policymakers, you're the, you're the navigators. In particular, you, you're at the helm. And uh, we're looking for leadership from, from the helm of the ship to navigate through this map that we've demonstrated. And I think some of us believe that uh, it's time to take decisive action and, uh, and find a good route based on the map that we've, that we've shown. So again, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I don't mean to be rude. Yeah. I just want to listen. We've got a Thanks. couple minutes left. I'm done. Yeah. I'm done. We've transitioned yeah. on to the last um, couple yeah. minutes. This graph shows that 93% that of the heat of global warming is in the ocean. The ocean has tremendous heat capacity, and therefore it is storing heat since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. That heat is being transported to the Arctic and the Antarctic by ocean currents, including the Gulf Stream, the Norwegian Current, the Imbinger Current, and so forth. It is getting in under both the sea ice, which is why the sea ice is disappearing so rapidly, and it's getting in under the glacial ice in Greenland. There's two miles of ice in the middle of Greenland, and the weight of that two miles of ice depresses the center of Greenland about 800 meters. So the center of Greenland, it looks like a big island, but it's not. The center part is like a dish, it's below sea level. So the warm ocean water has access through the fjords of Greenland. You might even get uh, transport across Greenland, which would greatly increase the uh, melt of ice. We can measure not only the height of the sea level, as Ben showed, but we also can measure the rate of change of the mass of ice in Greenland, like weighing the ice in Greenland, and the amount of ice lost is doubling every six years. And that should be very concerning because if we melt all of Greenland, that comes to 25 feet of sea level rise globally. That's a very scary thing. Right now, it's, it's melting at a relatively modest rate, and it's hard 
to get excited about something that only doubles every six years. You know, fires we understand because they might double every six seconds. And, you know, grandma's candle that falls on the Christmas tree uh, in 20 minutes, the house is all on fire. Uh, we're able to, to see that. With cancer, cancer may double every six months or something like that. So you don't delay attending to cancer. Same thing for sea level rise, even though it doubles in six years. If you imagine having an investment that doubled in six years, that would be a good deal. You'd have a hell of a retirement fund if you could find one of those. Unfortunately, this doubling is essentially adding sea level to the system. So homework assignment, if you start with one millimeter of sea level rise globally from the melt of, of uh, Greenland, and then you double it every six years, if you figure out what that is, double, two millimeter, four millimeter, six, and so forth up the, up the chain, it's a truly intimidating thing that we are looking at. And we don't exactly know how to turn it off. And there is permafrost sitting on the continental shelves and surrounding the Arctic Ocean, which is melting. Now, there, uh, we're delighted that you, that you brought us here uh, so we can present this material. Uh, there are business opportunities. I mean, if Florida got serious about doing solar, uh, you know, Massachusetts has pitiful, pitiful sunlight compared to Florida. They got 80 and 90,000 solar workers in Massachusetts. We have a, a tiny fraction of that. Uh, we have tremendous business opportunities here in Florida. There is a geothermal cooling industry which could happen here to replace a lot of the energy we're using in air conditioning. There are tremendous things that can be developed, but we got to get busy. And the thing about it, the longer you wait, the cost of the solution goes up about 40% a decade. Professor, I know all y'all traveled yeah, a long way, and, I'm, and we can oh, continue the conversations we've had over the last got, week. Got to have a, a reading assignment. Okay. Excellent. That's a, a layman's uh, style reading assignment on sea level rise, so you can see what it looks like physically. Thank you. We really appreciate your time. Yeah, Thank you very much. And Thank can, you very much. Can we stand at the ready to answer any questions? There's a, an institute called the Florida Climate Institute. That's a consortium of all the universities in Florida. And they're, they stand at the ready to answer any question you might have about climate or any, any question that the uh, administration has about climate. Great. Well, well, thank right you. In town. I'll come over any time. You live right here. Yes, sir. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much. Thanks again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.